Hello everyone. So in this tutorial, we'll be looking into how pipelining works and how single cycle and multi cycle clock implementation works. So as you can see, the first diagram shows a single cycle representation, which is basically uh, executing one instruction in one clock cycle. So you have clock cycle one, you would execute load instruction, clock cycle two, you execute store instruction, clock cycle three, you execute R type or J type, uh, so R type or uh, I type instruction, and so on and so forth. But in multi cycle, you divide each instruction into subdivisions, which has fetch, decode, execute, memory, and write back operations. And each of the subdivisions has a one clock cycle, as you can see. So fetch has clock cycle one, fetch, uh, decode has clock cycle two, execute has clock cycle three, and so on. Now in pipelining, what we have is we have concurrency. These two, everything was happen happening sequentially no matter what. In single cycle, even though it was just one instruction per clock cycle, it was again happening sequentially. In multi-cycle, even though it's a bit if more efficient than single cycle, it's still happening sequentially. But in pipeline, you're having concurrency. That means each of the instructions in every clock cycle, uh, other than the first clock cycle, there's always an instruction being executed. There, uh, there's always more than one instruction being executed. Which, which basically increases the throughput and uh, which in basically increases the throughput compared to the single cycle and multi cycle. Now, the reason that the fetch, the, the next instruction cannot start from the first is because you cannot share resources. The same resource cannot be used by both of these uh, instructions at the same time. You always have one resource for each uh, operation to execute. So you can't, so if you both want to fetch operations, you, you have to share resources and you, the sharing is not allowed in that case. Right, so uh, let's look at what will happen, like pipelining, what makes it easy for MIPS is that the, all instructions are of the same length, there's 32 bits instruction, so you can fetch in the first stage and you can decode in the second stage, and then we just have three instruction formats, the R type, I type, J type, so you can begin register, for, you can begin reading from the register file from the second stage, which is the decode stage, and then the fetch stage is basically fetching, decoding is just reading, and then executing is doing the ALE operation. Memory is basically uh, loading and storing, and write back is just writing from the memory into the register. Right. So you, ha uh, but in that case, you also have hazards uh, uh, hazards to do with my pipeline. And you can't always have an ideal pipeline. You still have some hazards like structural hazards, control hazards, and data hazards. So what are these hazards? Like, and how do we overcome them? Structural hazards is what if we had only one memory, like one memory for instruction, one memory that's for both instruction and data. And then what, what will happen when you have branching instructions? And what will happen when you have, um, when you have dependent, dependent instructions? So we'll be looking into that. So um, in a pipeline, when you have, uh, in a structural hazard, what you have uh, it occurs when you have uh, to use the same resource by two different instructions at the same time. So like I said, the memory. So how do we remedy that? How do we remedy, remedy the whole memory situation? Well, we can have separate memories. For, like, for memory, you can have one for instruction memory and one for data memory. So the first one, which is the fetch, fetching, fetching stage, you can have that as the instruction memory and the, and the memory stage, which is at the uh, second last stage, it will be the data memory. So we can have two separate memories, one for instruction and one for data. Now, when you have uh, when you have register file access, how do you determine when at which part of the register is uh, the read operation and which part of the register is the write operation? Now, in every register, we divide into two parts. The first part will be the write operation, and the second part will be the read operation. Right. And then when you have uh, what you call when you have an instruction like this, as you can see, there are dependent operators. Like the value of dollar one that will be written is de uh, the is dependent. Like this this operation is depending on the first operation because the dollar one value is updated over here, and then you can't use the new updated value unless that part is written down. So there are three ways to uh, uh, to overcome these hazards. One is the st when one is stalling. Another one is forwarding, and another one is rearranging. So three ways: stalling, forwarding, and rearranging. So first, we'll be looking into stalling. So in stalling, what you do is you give a wait time. You just wait for that part to be written down into the register, and then then that value will again be read on the 
the second stage. For example, in this case, the part, the dollar one, the, the value has been, the value has been written into dollar one register at this stage, at this red area stage. Well, because as I said in the beginning, the first stage is the write and the second stage is the read operation. So it's being written on this stage. Now, before the second operation could access that value, that part uh, takes place later than when this part, uh, when this operation can read the value. It reads the value in the second stage, but then it's not getting the updated value from the first stage. So what do we do? We put stall. We basically put two stall cycles over here or three stall, stall cycles as we require until that part of the uh, written, uh, that part that where, where it's written can be accessed where it's been read on the second stage. So you get a stall cycle, two stall cycles like this. So you, you write the value over here and you put stall, stall, and then second instruction can successfully read the updated value from here in the read stage that that value is uh, where it's written it's the new value will be read on that stage after two stall cycles, right? But this, on the other hand, it affects the CPI. It will affect the throughput. So you won't still have that much of a good effective, um, uh, like uh, effective usage of time. The main reason that we're using pipelining is so that we have more effective and efficient use of time. But if if we have stall cycle, if we if we have to give a lot of stalls, then we are not actually um, utilizing pipelining efficiently. So another way to fix data hazard is to use forwarding, which which actually is the most effective way to, uh, to prevent data hazard. So what you do in forwarding is that you, you have an, at each stage of this pipeline, at each stage of this uh, data path, you always have state registers. Like for example, in the fetch, in the fetch operation, whatever value is fetched is always stored in the registers in between. There's always a register in between all these stages. So that updated value is stored in that stage. For example, in the ALS stage, whatever value you've calculated, it's always stored in a register also, because that value is to be propagated into this register and then stored into that register in the right stage. So of course, it's always have to, it has to be stored temporarily in a register. So instead of just waiting for that to propagate it and then store written into the register, we could just directly uh, forward that value into the next stage of the uh, into the next stage, so that in this register we can access that value from directly from the uh, from that from that register. We could just directly forward the values. But in here, in the OR operation, the fourth instruction, you don't need the state registers. By that time, that value has been written into the into the register and then you can just access that value on the read, read in the read cycle in the write cycle when it's been written you can just execute you can just access that value in the read cycle and the same way with the XOR operation as well so that's one that's forwarding now rearranging is another thing for another way to uh fix data hazard but that uh happens when you have very few, in, uh, um, very few, when you have uh, very few independent, very few dependent operations. For example, if if you could rearrange, if you could rearrange this, for example, this operation could not be rearranged because it, it's always dependent on on the, no matter what, it's always dependent on the first operation. So after the first operation, after we get the value from the first operation, the we can always uh, what you call we can always get the updated value, right? But then uh, in an operation, in a, in a, in a so one way you could, uh, so the way you could uh, prevent, uh, another way to prevent hazard is rearranging, as I said. So the, the way to do that is to first identify the independent operations. As you can see, this second instruction is, in, is dependent on the first operation, first instruction, and then the fifth instruction is dependent on the fourth instruction. So, uh, uh, if you if these are if these are dependent, you could obviously first execute the independent operations, which are one, three, and four, and then you could execute the dependent operations after the independent operations are executed. Because by that time, the new value would be written into the register in the write back stage, and then you wouldn't need to put any stall cycle or even need to do forwarding as well. But this does not happen all the time. This only happens when you have a lot of independent operations and only a few dependent dependent operations. But you have, if you have all the if all the instructions after the first instruction be, uh, is 
uh, uh, turns out to be dependent operations, then there's no point. Then there's no point in re-entering. Then you would have to resort to stalling or forwarding. Right, so that's about it for pipelining and how pipelining works. So give a thumbs up if you've understood the concept of pipelining in MITS architecture and good luck.